Welcome to the uh, Fire Adapted Communities in New Mexico webinar. Uh, my name is Sam Barry, and uh, I'm here with Gabe Kohler. He's going to do um, the introduction and help me host today's webinar. So I'll turn it over to him. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you made it to the right place. Like Sam said, this is the, the Home Ignition Zone webinar um, made possible by Fire Adapted Communities New Mexico. Um, and just want to welcome you all for being here. Um, and, and thank you for, you know, being with us in this time when we have to social distance and be willing to take this webinar with us. So um, before we get started, I just want to kind of lay out some, some ground rules here just to make sure that the webinar runs smoothly. Um, some of the first things, um, here we are. Um, just, you know, please be present, be kind, and be respectful. Um, I think we have all of your, your microphones muted, um, but please don't unmute. We just wanna make sure to minimize background noise throughout the webinar. Um, and also, you know, we recommend that you turn off your video until the question and answer session at the end. Um, and the reason is for that is to kind of maintain a high quality of streaming so that the video quality isn't lagging or um, you know, all jumbled up. So yeah, please keep your, your cameras off as well. Um, and finally, if you have questions or comments along the way, uh, please enter those into the chat box, which is in the center of the platform at the bottom of, the, of your screen. Um, you can enter questions in there or comments, and I will be checking those throughout the webinar. If it's something I can respond to, I'll send you a link or, or something like that. But um, a lot of those will pull to the end of the webinar when we do the question and answer session. So thank you. Um, and now I just, you know, I want to introduce myself. I'm Gabe Kohler. I work with the Forest Stewards Guild, um, which is a nonprofit out of Santa Fe. We're a nationwide nonprofit. Um, we kind of work at the, the nexus of social, ecological, and um, economic forestry. Um, and so, of course, we are, we are very involved in wildfire issues um, nationwide, but also especially here in the Southwest. Um, and one of the things I work on with the Forest Stewards Guild is Fire Adapted Communities New Mexico, um, which is who's hosting this webinar today. Um, and so I just encourage all of you to become a part of this network. If you haven't already, please join Fire Adapted Communities Network. Um, it's a great resource finding any kind of information about wildfire and how you can be a better adapted to living in a fire prone forested area. So. Um, and I'll give you a little background about how Fire Adopted Communities New Mexico came to be just really quickly here before we get started. Um, it kind of started off with the National Cohesive Wildland Fire Management Strategy, um, which, as many of you may know, um, you know, this is, a, this is a collaborative process, you know, with active involvement of all levels of government and non-governmental organizations, as well as the public. So it's kind of this multifaceted collaborative process. And the goal of that was to seek national all land solutions to wildland fire management. And so as part of the, the cohesive strategy, um, they, were, they wanted to focus on three key areas, uh, restoring and maintaining landscapes, building fire adapted communities and working on our response to fire. Um, and so what Fire Adapted Communities New Mexico seeks to do is kind of fill that second key area is you know, working towards communities that are better adapted to living alongside wildfire. And that kind of moves into the next uh, bit here, um, which is kind of this new paradigm around fire management. Um, and, that's, and that's kind of what Fire Adapted Communities represents is this kind of reframing of how we talk and think about wildland fire and how we plan to live and work um, with it. Um, so here you can see on this slide, you know, the dominant paradigm being in the past that fire is, you know, war on fire and kind of fire being the problem to reframing that to how can we work with um, wildfire as it is a necessary and natural process that we know is increasing with climate change and, and, and into the future. And so it's kind of reframing how can we create communities that are, that are prepared for this um, increased wildfire frequency and severity on the landscape. Um, so yeah, so it, it changes the way that we talk and think about wildfire, as you can see on this slide here, but it also, um, in, an, in a more formal way, fire adapted communities um, are, is kind of a social framework for us to share information and to put projects onto the ground. And so it's not only 
just a new way of thinking and talking about fire, but we actually have formal networks like Fire Adapt Commun Communities New Mexico and like the National, um, the National um, Fire Adapt Communities Learning Network. And that takes us into the next uh, slide here. Um, and so this, this National Fire Adapted Communities Learning Network is, um, is really committed to supporting people and communities who are, um, that are striving to be more, to live more safely alongside wildfire. Um, and so, you know, as part of that, they are sharing information at the national level. Um, we work very closely with this national learning network um, in our efforts statewide in Fire Adaptive Communities New Mexico. And so there's a lot of information sharing between the national network and all these different statewide networks like Fire Adaptive Communities New Mexico. I mean, we are a part of this larger national net network. Um, and that's really important because it provides a platform for people to share lessons learned and to kind of provide best practices for fire mitigation work, for community building work, all kinds of different things. And so we're really tapped into that national network to provide the best resources here in New Mexico and to try and help people find, you know, where to get started in their, their process of being more fire adapted um, communities. So that takes us into what we're working on here in New Mexico with our statewide network. Um, can't see if that's popped over yet. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, at its core here at Fire Adapted Communities New Mexico, you know, it's, it's a grassroots effort, very similar to the, to the national cohesive strategy. We work with all government, all levels of government. We work with um, nonprofits. We work with the public. Um, it's, it's really striving to be this um, cross boundary and interagency effort for wildfire mitigation. So it's not just focused on um, certain types of land or certain land ownerships, but it's across the landscape. And that's really important about fire adaptive communities is that it has that landscape approach. Um, and we really are working to help fac and members feel empowered to take action to reduce wildfire risk to their homes and communities. And so, like I said, it's a member-driven effort. Um, we encourage everyone to become a member. Um, it really helps us share information across the state and then also share what we learn here in New Mexico back to that national network. Um, it's kind of the tool that's gonna help us put that, that key topic area in the cohesive strategy into action. So this is, a, this is kind of our, um, the network approach that's really powerful. And we encourage that our, our members recognize that fire has a role to play and that we live in fire adaptive ecosystems, especially here in the desert Southwest. Um, and so this next graphic here, we call this the fire adaptive communities wheel or, or pinwheel graphic. Um, this really shows kind of how like multifaceted the, the fire adapted communities framework is. It's different than FireWise or some of these more specific kind of preparedness programs that we're all familiar with. And some of the stuff we're gonna talk about today fits within this fact wheel, as you can see here. Um, the, the six o'clock part of the wheel says resident and community mitigation. So right below there, you see FireWise, defensible space, and home hardening. That's, that's kind of where, the, what we're working on today in this home ignition zone webinar. Um, but as you can see, Fire Adapted Communities is kind of this ongoing process that includes everything from preparation to wildfire recovery. Um, so it's, it's, it's a lot broader and it's really never done. It's, it's a different way of thinking about our community's relationship that is ongoing. Um, and it encompasses, you know, it, it, it encompasses a different group of people, not only people who work in forestry and fire, but also our, our community leaders. We really work with, you know, we try and work with Chamber of Commerce, different folks than you might expect to be working on, um, you know, wildfire preparedness and, and adapting our communities to wildfire. It's much broader and in including things like, you know, business resiliency, um, including things like water, making sure that, you know, we have a, rest, uh, a recovery effort after a fire. So this is a, this is a broader framework. And so, um, yeah, I, I hope you, um, you join us at the Fire Adapted Communities Network. Um, I thank you for being here today. Uh, this is a really great place to start. Um, and, I, and I hope that 
please tell your friends about this webinar and, and what we're working on here state in, in our state um, and what's going on nationally, because this is a really powerful tool for sharing information and kind of empowering people to action. Um, and with that, I want to introduce Sam Barry, who introduced me um, <laughs> uh, from the Guild. Sam is going to be sharing with us some, some strategies for making your home better prepared for wildfire. And with that, I'll, I'll pass it back to Sam. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Gay. Um, so yeah, today we're going to kind of go in depth here with the home ignition zone. Um, and this is a big topic. We're going to try to cover as much as we can in the next 45 minutes or so to leave some time for questions. Um, and so we've got like 46 people here today. So if you missed the very beginning, uh, type your questions into the chat box. Gabe will respond to them as he can, and then we'll cover as many of those at the end. I think since we have so many people, we won't be able to unmute people um, to ask questions. Um, and the whole reason that we're here doing this is that we, Gabe and I, would be out doing a bunch of public events this time of year. Um, and so we're happy to be able to um, put on this webinar and have a bunch of people from all across the state. So some people have typed in where they're from in the chat box. If you want to do that too, uh, go ahead. All right. So, um, so like I said, I work for the Forest Stewards Guild and together the Forest Stewards Guild helps uh, run this Fire Adapted Communities New Mexico. So the first slide is about Fire Adapted Communities, but I'm going to kind of skip through this. But the general idea is that, you know, if you work on around your home, that's the first step. And then we kind of build out from there into our neighborhood, into our wider uh, landscapes and all of that. But Gabe did a good job covering this so we can skip through here. All right. So um, like I said, this is a complicated topic um, and we're going to cover a lot today, but I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about the basics of wildfire. Um, and how fire moves to get you kind of thinking about the things you can do. So instead of just giving you a bulleted list, and we'll get to some of that, but um, we'll kind of spend a little bit of time talking about fire behavior so you can kind of conceptualize how, uh, you know, what you might do to apply to your specific situation or your neighbor's house or that kind of thing. Um, so while we're here, we know that mitigation and home hardening works. Um, houses are saved because of these things. Um, we also know that wildfires are increasing, wooey losses are increasing, um, and then we know that mitigation work benefits outweigh the costs of doing that work. Um, although it's, it, we spend a lot of money suppressing fires every year, uh, there's a lot of research that shows that if we spend that money up front doing preparation, um, we can reduce those costs later on. Uh, and so that's uh, something that Gabe and I kind of work towards in a lot of different ways at the Guild and through Fire Adapted Communities in Mexico. So a little outline, like I said, we're going to talk about uh, fire behavior. We're going to talk about some definitions. And then um, we're going to talk about home ignition zone concepts. And I just realized I'm missing a slide here. Um, I I hid this slide when I exported this before, but I had a little slide introducing myself, so I'll just do that now. Uh, like I said, my name's Sam. Um, I've been here at the Guild for like three years. Uh, before that, I was a wildland firefighter for six seasons with the Forest Service, and before that, I lived in Northern California. Um, and two summers there, we had big wildfires that were threatening my home there where I was living, and I actually got laid off of work. Um, and so I've spent a lot of time those two summers doing all of the things um, that we're going to talk about. And I had a funny picture of like me and my dog looking sad and a bunch of smoke, uh, but you'll have to just imagine that. So anyway, the things I'm going to talk about, um, I've actually done a lot of these and uh, thought about it a lot. So, all right, so we're going to get right into fire behavior. So, um, <clears throat> so learning about fire behavior, it helps you like envision the threats facing your home and then you can decide what to do. So, there's two big threats to your home. And the first one is the flaming front. So this is what you think of when you think of a wildfire, you think of all this uh, wall of flames coming towards your home. And then firefighters break down the flaming front into different types of fire. So there's surface fire, which um, is here in the bottom of the screen. And this is fire that kind of, you know, just is moving along the ground. It's burning those 
fuels on the ground, so grass or uh, mulch or litter, you know, small sticks, that kind of thing. And then the other types are crown fire. Um, and crown fire is when that surface fire can move up into trees and bushes and um, kind of, you know, move up into the trees. And so there's two types of crown fire. There's passive crown fire. And what that means is that there's just enough fuel in one spot where that those flames can move up into that one tree. And an active crown fire is when it gets into one tree and it's, the next tree is close enough that it, the flames can ignite that next tree and kind of keep moving. Um, and so thinking about these types of fire helps you kind of think about the work that you do around your home, right? You definitely don't want active crown fire because that's going to produce the most heat. You can kind of just feel it off this picture maybe. Um, and that radiant heat that comes off the flame, sometimes that's enough to ignite your home. Uh, and so you want to keep it, I mean, ideally there's no flames next to your home, but you want to keep it to the surface fire if possible. Um, and that's kind of like thinning techniques uh, that we'll talk about later. But, um, you know, thinking about these types of fire, I think kind of helps uh, paint the picture. So um, with that surface fire, the next thing I want to talk about is receptive fuels. And you'll see we'll talk about this a lot in the next 40 minutes or so. Um, so receptive fuels are smaller fuels that ignite larger fuels. And you'll hear the term fine fuels used a lot. Um, and that's like a semi-technical term that means anything less than a quarter inch. And so if you think about um, building a campfire, you know, you need these fine fuels to get the fire going. So these are the things that are going to cause you the most problems if they're close to your house. And this is also the things that fire is going to move through. So if you can imagine you had like a, a log and then another log in your yard, fire is not going to catch that unless there's smaller things near it or next to it that are going to catch it. So these fine fuels are what you really want to focus on um, when you're thinking about um, hardening your home to fire. Um, and so we'll come back to this quite a bit in the next little bit. Okay, so then the other thing to worry about is ember wash. So um, the way I've heard this described is a snowstorm of embers. And I'm going to play this video. This is pretty uh, bad quality, but it's, I've had a hard time finding much better. So this is the snowstorm of embers. Um, and this is from a video in Southern California. But when, a, when we get that active crown fire where it's moving through a bunch of trees, it can send up all of these embers uh, aloft, right? And then they kind of rain down. And the closer you are to where they're produced, the more of them are going to hit the ground. Um, but you can kind of see here, these are like big chunks that are bouncing off this truck. Um, and these embers can actually land in that fine fuel when it's close to your house and, and get those going. Um, so we think about the flaming front, so the actual flames coming and impacting our home. And then we think about these embers that can either land in fuels that aren't burning already and start them, um, or they can uh, get inside your home through like vents or broken windows or that kind of thing. So those are the two main threats. And actually these embers um, can cause, I think that there's some research that shows they've caused almost 60% of homes to burn is from ember wash. And this snowstorm analogy is a good one. So if you go outside and you look um, at your house, you can kind of imagine where snow would kind of like eddy or like flurry around. Um, and those are the same places where embers are going to catch. That's this catch on complex shapes here at the end. And they catch on roofs. You know, you can just imagine kind of where snow collects. So that's the quick um, fire behavior section. Um, the next part is this definition. So we talk a lot about defensible space. You hear that term over and over. It's kind of the bedrock, a lot of this stuff. And defensible space uh, is a good term, um, but I kind of want to introduce this other term called survivable space. So defensible space implies that someone will be there to defend your home, right? You're creating a space that's defensible. Um, I've heard this good phrase, putting out the welcome mat for firefighters, not the fire. Um, and this is super important, right? You're making that space so that you can, your home can survive if there's someone there protecting it. Uh, but if you can imagine, you know, there's a, a new start, a new fire 
upcoming um, firefighters may not always be available. And so uh, this other term is survivable space, meaning you've completed enough preparations at your home that your house can survive with no assistance, um, meaning that you've evacuated, so you're prepared to evacuate, and there's no one there at your home and your house can survive. So um, I'll use the term defensible space throughout the rest of this presentation because it's so ubiquitous. Um, but just have in the mind in your mind that you know firefighters may not always be there. It may not be safe for them. They may not be available. Uh, but that said, the more work you put in, um, it is more likely that firefighters will come uh, and invest time if they can. Right. So this picture at the bottom is actually my house in Northern California, and this is the ideal situation. Right. Uh, the fire truck is there in your yard, uh, but that may not always happen. Okay, so um, this is the, the bedrock of uh, fire behavior, right? The fire triangle. Uh, so how do we go about creating the survivable space? So what we need to do is break this triangle. This is what they teach basic firefighters to, right? Um, and so we can't really take away oxygen out of the equation, but we can, um, and we, heat is hard to remove too if it's already going. There are some like insulation things we can do uh, that we'll talk about. Uh, but the big one is removing fuel, um, removing those fine fuels, finding them, uh, and then getting them out of there, especially in the places where it's most impactful. Okay, so um, the home ignition zone uh, kind of combines these two concepts of the quality of the defensible space, like we just talked about, and that's the area like from the edge of your home, like the, where the wall hits dirt, um, out. And then the structural ignitability, so the actual at attributes of the structure and how those can uh, make that uh, more flammable, I guess. So um, basic, basically, your home can survive a wildfire by removing ignition sources from within the home ignition zone. Um, and then the, the caveat here is that uh, you can create survivable space without making your home a parking lot, right? So obviously, if you did make your home a parking lot, that's going to be great. That's the best thing, but no one wants to live there. So we'll kind of talk about this a little bit throughout this presentation. Is much like everything in life. Uh, as you're thinking about this, it's all about trade-offs of like, how can I make this as fireproof as possible while still making it um, a place I want to be, um, you know, or mitigating it with wildlife concerns if you're thinking about thinning or all these other things. So this home ignition zone is full of trade-offs. And I wanted to acknowledge that, you know, we understand that we're not asking you to cut every tree on your property while we're going through this, but there's lots of other things that we can do. Okay, so um, like we talked about, the most important areas is what the home is made of, and then the first five feet and then the first 30 feet. Um, and so there's a lot of work that happens outside of these zones um, past 30 feet. Uh, and then, you know, even into like the ne neighboring national forest or that kind of thing. Um, but for today, we're gonna focus on the first five feet and the first 30 feet as the most important spots. And there's actually been some research that came out of uh, the Paradise Fire to kind of support these, that these are the most important areas. Um, but one thing to think about is that any outbuildings or other structures need to be included in this zone. So uh, on the house on the top, it's a little hard to see, but there's a little pill, pill shape here, and that is a propane tank. And so in my mind, I would include that in my first five feet zone because if the propane tank uh, gets too much heat on it, it's gonna vent and, you know, uh, it won't explode. Propane tanks usually don't explode, but they vent and they shoot flames into the sky. Uh, so you want to also prevent that from catching on fire. You want to prevent your sheds from catching on fire, especially if, you know, these sheds at the bottom, if they were within the 30 feet, you would think even harder about that. So that's a big caveat is including um, sheds or other structures or any sort of things that are nearby your home that if they caught on fire would put more heat on your home. Um, including that in your little, your circle. Okay, let me take a drink here. 
Okay, so we're going to start by talking about the first five feet. So the goal here is pretty simple, right? We're trying to prevent flame contact with the structure. So we don't want anything that could catch on fire that would put flames and thus heat right on our home. And then we don't want to provide fuels that embers or surface fire could ignite. So uh, this uh, starts off really simple, right? We just want to clean up. Um, we want to remove fuels, those fine fuels that could catch. And so this is a, like what I, a lot of, I spent a lot of time doing this um, when we were kind of waiting for the fire to come in Northern California is just raking and getting rid of those fine fuels. And this is a huge thing um, that I think gets somewhat overlooked. Um, it's easy to focus on the big picture and you know, the acres of thinning you might need to do or um, those sort of things that are more complicated, but just cleaning around your house, cleaning your gutters is crucial. Um, and then looking for these kind of things where that fuel might build up over the fall and winter. So we talked about uh, shapes where those embers are gonna catch like a corner like this, you know, is more likely for embers to come into that corner and then land on that stuff there in the corner and, and catch on fire. Uh, places like this where it's, you know, gotten under the deck. Um, and right, we can see here, there's a bunch of leaves built up right next to this propane valve. So that's not ideal. Um, and then so ideally you want to install some sort of fire resistant materials in the first feet. Uh, so like a gravel barrier or even just bare dirt is going to be the best thing. Right, because if those embers land there or if the surface fuel or surface fire is burning along, it's going to stop and, and go out. Uh, but like we mentioned, um, you may not want to have a gravel moat all the way around your home. And I get that. Uh, so there's some other things we can do, right? The type of plants that we plant next to our home or anywhere is going to be super important. Um, you plant more of like a leafy green bush that's going to have more water content in it and it's going to be less likely to ignite. Uh, and so there's other issues of like um, water and the southwest of course to think about, but this is one way to do this. Um, and there's actually a whole list of these plants um, that was developed by the New Mexico State University. They have a firewise planting guide that'll tell you all the plants uh, that are native, I think there might be some non-native ones on there too, but plants that are good to, um, they're less flammable. And then resinous plants such as like juniper or pinion, you know, those plants are adapted to live in desert climates and so they're more resinous so they can retain the little bits of water they have, but that also means they're more flammable. Um, and so this bottom picture is kind of showing, you know, if you had a juniper bush like this right next to your, this is a fence, but right next to your house, but it's not surrounded by other plants, how is this gonna catch on fire, right? Think about those fire behavior sheets we saw, or uh, slides we saw, you know, if embers land on this, you know, or surface fire is not gonna be able to burn up to that juniper on the bottom. Um, and then if embers land on it, they may not catch it. Uh, so thinking about how you can separate things, um, where you plant stuff, like you don't want to plant something under a window because if the bush catches on fire, the window is more likely to break than a wall. Um, and so there's other things we can do that isn't just having that five feet of gravel. So this, like I said, it's all about these trade-offs and kind of thinking about, thinking you know more about what you're gonna do. So the other thing that's really important is maintaining your landscaping. So we talked about raking next to your house. The other thing is, you know, if you have a bush like that juniper in the previous slide and embers land under that and there's a bunch of dead juniper litter, um, like pine needles that have fallen off, uh, those are more likely to catch. And then when that catches, it might catch the bush above on top. And so this picture is just showing like, you know, spending a few minutes pulling all that dead needles out of this lavender plant is gonna make it more resistant to fire. It's not a guarantee, nothing is the guarantee in this, unfortunately, but um, so these sort of things, uh, they seem really simple, but um, you know, they're really important. We're just looking for those fine fuels. We're looking for places where fire is gonna spread uh, and then we're removing that from within the 
the zone close to our house. Um, and then, you know, we just don't want to store anything flammable in that zone. So uh, you don't want to have your wood pile there. You don't want to have your barbecue in that first five feet, maybe. Um, and then this is, so a lot of this is just these trade-offs, you know. Uh, I have some patio furniture in my backyard, but you need to just have a plan to be able to move those things out of that five feet zone when you leave or preferably even further. Or if you have a patio furniture that has cushions on it, you know, be able to bring those inside if you were going to evacuate. Um, but you just don't want anything flammable in that first, that first five feet. So um, this is kind of my little example here. We can imagine uh, we can see this walkway here on the right. So if fire was coming from the right, it would hit that and and not be able to move closer to the home. There's quite a bit of pine needles under this tree and in the foreground here. So those are what you'd want to remove. And the five feet is sort of the minimum. You know, the further out you can push that, the better. Um, but this tree has been kind of trimmed up a little bit. It could go up a little further. Um, but how it is now, if you raked everything out from under this, um, it's unlikely that that surface fire is going to be able to get up into the, the tree above, right? So thinking about how you can remove those opportunities for fire to move around. Um, and then this other bush, you know, seems really inflammable to me. Obviously, it hasn't leafed out yet, but even when it has leaves, they'll probably be small. They'll probably have water content in them, um, that sort of thing. So this is just kind of like a scene. If I was standing here, I'd look at this and be like, well, you know, I might prune up that tree a little bit uh, from the bottom. I might, and then I would definitely rake out all of these needles and take them to some place that's more than 30 feet away from my home. Okay, so that section, it seems really simple, like I said, but it's just really, really crucial to think about that first five feet. Like I said, when I lived, in Northern California and I was doing this, I would, I was kind of freaked out because there was a big smoke column over the hill and I would just go outside every morning and like rake again. Um, but it's just super crucial that you keep that area clean. Um, and I, I wouldn't, you know, advocate turning into getting too in depth of it, but even if you spend, uh, you know, half a day on a Saturday, right before fire season, you clean it out and then you just keep an eye on it and maintain it as needed. Okay, so um, we're going to move now into structure hazards. So this is the actual uh, construction of your home. So what it's made of, how it's built, um, and then maintenance. So the goal here is to keep embers out of your house, so on the outside. And then if they are going to land on your house, have them land on non-flammable things. Um, so this is kind of akin to the parking lot example. If we had like a cement cube, uh, that would be the safest thing. But of course, that's not going to happen. So we just need to mitigate where we can. Um, and so we'll kind of go over this. Um, there's a lot of really great in-depth information from NFPA and from the insurance. Oh, I cannot remember the acronym, but it's the... Uh, insurance bureau they do a lot of studies about this kind of thing and they have like a giant house they put in a warehouse and they blow embers at it and there's a really great video of that on the fac and m website um, you can see and they they have like the house is built out of different materials and they really test all these things out so there's a lot of really good in-depth information um, and a lot of that is on the fac and m uh, prepare page uh, so We'll go over things quickly, but then I'll keep referring back to these other more in-depth uh, sheets and those information. Okay, so we'll start at the top. Um, so roof, roofs and, and gutters. So again, we want to keep it uh, fuel-free. So you can see here in this picture, uh, the, all those fine fuels that are on the roof um, build up. So you can imagine if embers they're going to land on that and then catch that on fire. And then whereas your roof could probably withstand embers landing on it, um, if, it's, if it has like that sustained heat, uh, there's a chance that it could combust. 
of like the actual roof could combust or it can get the under layers or the structure under there. So keeping your roof clean, keeping your gutters clean is really important. And then the materials that it's made out of, uh, these class A ones you see on the list here are all approved. Um, and then also I've, I've heard that a lot of the like foam roofs or that sort of things that we use in the Southwest are also non-combustible. Um, it's just you need to keep those leaves and that sort of fuels off here. So there aren't a lot of places where they they tell you that you sh like you should do something that's big construction project. But if you have a a shake shingle roof, so like a wood shingle roof, those are the that's one thing where you need to replace that. Um, but a lot of these other things, if you you know, it's like if you're going to replace your roof, you know, think about picking one of these class A materials. Whereas in the meantime, you could probably just clean it really well and be, be covered. Um, so let's see here. So like I said, those complex areas, so valleys in your ridges or any edges are places to really pay attention to. Um, any place where there's a gap in the roof where debris can accumulate and the embers will accumulate in that same place where the debris accumulates. Um, Great, so eaves are another thing. Um, anytime there's an overhang, there's an increased risk, right? Because heat rises. Think about, you know, when you're making that campfire, you build a small fire and you put something right on top of it. So eaves can kind of uh, function the same way. And anytime you have a complex eave with like more shapes, you know, the more chances it's gonna catch embers or it's gonna catch heat. Um, and so there's a really great NFPA fact sheet all about this, about how to construct eaves to make sure that they uh, um, kind of shed that heat better and don't trap embers. And this is one of those things where um, it's like, this is like the bigger project where you start with the raking, start with the easy things, and then start moving up to these bigger projects. Uh, but definitely take, take a look at that fact sheet if this is something if your eave looks like this, um, or if you have a tree right under it, obviously that's not gonna be, be that great, but you know, basically the less complex the shape, the more like boxed in it is, the better. Okay, so vents are really important. Um, this is where embers can actually get inside your home. So um, there's some brands here, this Vulcan fire guard of like actual vents designed for wildfires where if, I think if they get a certain amount of heat, they'll close automatically. Um, but otherwise, you know, just screening them is good. And eighth inch metal screen is recommended. Uh, you'll see it in the video, if you watch the insurance bureau video, which I highly recommend, uh, eighth inch doesn't keep out all embers, but this is that trade-off we were talking about of um, if you go smaller than that, you're kind of risking cutting off ventilation to your home. Um, and so this is like the trade-off thing, right? Uh, of figuring out what's the smallest you can go. If you wanna go smaller, you just need to clean it more often. Um, and like I said, again, there's a good fact sheet about this, but, but these vents are super important because this is how embers can get directly inside your home and then light, you know, ignite the insulation or ignite other, other things inside your home. Um, and then keep maintain, maintenance is a big part of all this. So making sure that a squirrel hasn't gotten in and torn a hole through your vent or all of that kind of thing is really crucial too. Okay. All right, so um, walls. So here in the Southwest, uh, well, at least in Santa Fe where I live, most um, homes are stucco, uh, which is really um, pretty fire resistant, but there's a lot of other fire resistant materials here. Um, and then like we talked about with the, the campfire analogy, you know, the, like a large diameter log home is, is actually pretty resistant to fire because it takes a lot of heat to get that, that log going. Um, and it has wood as a combustible wall. And of course there's like a million types of wood paneling and that sort of thing. Um, but it's fine if, if you have that, right? You don't need to necessarily re, redo your whole home. Although if you do think about these more non-combustible things, but you just need to be uh, more careful with mitigating the flammable materials next to your house that might 
lighter, more flammable wall. So kind of that, that trade off of, um, you know, mitigating more if you have a flammable wall than if you didn't. Um, and then the way these walls are going to, they probably won't catch from embers. It'll be more of that direct heat or flame contact. Okay, so windows. Um, so wi windows are like the thinnest barrier, right? Other than the vents for embers to get inside your home. So a single pane window is pretty good. Uh, double pane is better. Tempered is even better than that. And the reason for that is that if you do get direct radiant heat or flame contact, uh, double pane, just like there's that, the reason we have double panes is it's more insulating. Um, so we're not losing heat out, but they also just have more of that insulating quality so that they resist um, changes in temperature that would then break the glass. So this is one of those things where if you're going to go about replacing your windows, you lived in a high wildfire risk area, you might think about getting tempered windows that are even more resistant. Um, the other thing is flames can ignite the wood or the vinyl in the frame. Um, and that can be a problem. So that's what we talked about. If you have landscaping around the bottom of your home, maybe don't plant something right under the window. Um, and then another thing is that aluminum screens a little better than vinyl because aluminum will melt when embers hit it. Uh, so this is another thing where, you know, people smarter than me have done a lot of research that you can benefit from, but just in general, thinking about having uh, more heat resistant uh, windows. Okay, so fences. Fences can transport flames or you know, fire a long ways along the fence. Um, and what you want to do is be able to separate the fence from the structure. So uh, you know, you can see here we have this adobe wall, and then we have a um, coyote fence. And these are complex. The fence is especially complex. It has all this dry, fine fuel attached to it. They're very flammable. Um, but we just need to separate the fence from the structure. So um, they actually, NFPA actually recommends that at the very least, just putting like a piece of metal flashing there can be enough to insulate your wall from the fence. Um, and then of course, better than that would be to have like a cinder block pier or a metal gate or just anything that pushes that flammable material out, out from the home. Um, so here's kind of a picture of what that might look like if you had like a, a gate, you know, and then you had your, uh, cinder block kind of wall separating it. And then also, you know, think about if your fence is attached to your home like this, you need to think about your fence as like an attachment or an outbuilding almost. So raking along the bottom of it and making it, you know, a little more, less flammable that way. Okay, so decks. Um, so uh, everyone loves a good deck. There's a reason why they're so common. Um, they are super, they can be more flammable because they have all these complex edges. They're not so, they don't go to the ground. Um, so I like to think about the deck as part of the structure, right? So we need to extend that five foot zone out from the deck. This top photo actually shows embers where they can catch on the deck. Um, so if you have like a gap in the deck, what they're showing, this is actually a photo from that um, insurance bureau study. Um, and so all these embers are catching in that gap. So there's some things you can do, like have a con uh, solid construction where you don't have that gap. You're just not providing a place for embers to catch. You can use non-combustible decking. Um, and then you can enclose it if possible. So uh, obviously, if you have a short deck, like on the bottom, you might think about just uh, enclosing that all the way to the ground. And then that saves you uh, trying to fish the leaves out from under there. Because what we don't really don't want is having embers get under that deck and then igniting leaves or grass or something under the deck and then catching the deck on fire. And then once the deck is on fire, catching the, the home on fire. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, at the least, you know, want to, you want to keep it real clean and raked out from under there because the decks, sometimes they catch like this with the embers on the top, but you know, you're more likely to ignite fine fuels that then ignite the deck and then go up from there. Um, so yeah, it's real tempting when you have a, a tall deck like this to store stuff down there. Um, and that's something we don't want to do. We don't want to keep any debris in that first five feet. 
that might ignite and then catch the deck on fire. So this one in the bottom is actually looking pretty good. They've got the gravel. There's a little bit of leaves in there, but um, those would be easy to get rid of. Uh, so yeah, just thinking about that deck as an extension of your home where you want to maintain that everything we talked about in the five foot section. So this is an example where, you know, they have this rabbit brush kind of going right up to the edge of the deck. So you can, um, you know, think back to the fire slide. You can imagine that fire kind of moving through this rabbit brush and then coming right up on the deck uh, and putting that flame contact on the deck and then, then on the house. So just, again, think about that five foot zone. All right, and then we talked about this earlier, but um, all the debris, aka your junk that gathers around your home, um, super easy for this to happen. Uh, but this is the stuff that can catch fire and then catch, you know, break a window or do something else. So thinking about all this stuff, raking it out. Um, this picture, you can kind of see where there's this plastic container in the middle. You're creating more complex shapes for embers to catch in you know, more places for pine needles to catch. Uh, the grill here is looking okay. It's far enough away. I mean, obviously the further the better, but, um, but any of these things, you need to either be prepared to bring them in if you evacuate. So like doormats or patio furniture, or you just need to not have it right next to your home. Um, you know, store that stuff, you know, ideally five feet away, maybe even further away if it's not something you use often. Um, so just think about that snowstorm of embers and what, what might catch. So this is just another example, um, you know, storing fence posts under the propane tank. Yeah, good idea. Okay, so um, beyond five feet, so to 30 feet and then beyond there. So you'll hear this, there's a bunch of different um, methods, but they're all similar. Usually they're, that's like zone one is right next to the house. And sometimes that's five feet, sometimes it's 30 feet. And then there's zone two and zone three. Um, and they all have slightly different things, but basically outside of that five feet, the rules are kind of the same. What you want to do is ideally have no surface fire. And then I, and then if you do bring that, or how, ideally have no fire, and if you do have some, bring that fire to the ground. So we're not, you know, catching whole trees on fire. Uh, and we wanna decrease the intensity, the, so decreasing the flame length and the temperature, decreasing the speed um, and making it safe for firefighters to be there. So <clears throat> this picture again is uh, from a, from a fire right here. So this is a good example in the foreground here. This is actually a fire line, right? Firefighters built, but you can imagine that being your five feet zone. You can see there's no surface fire moving through that zone where it's down to mostly dirt. Um, and then beyond that, we have that surface fire and you can see the flame links coming off that surface fire are between like two inches and a foot. So you can imagine that that's not gonna be nearly as threatening to your home as this sort of uh, crown fire in the back. So we do that by um, either removing fuels completely, and then there's uh, horizontal separation. So moving trees far enough apart or vegetation far enough apart that if one catches on fire, it won't spread to the next. And then vertical separation. So um, you'll hear this term ladder fuels, and that just means any fuels that are small enough that it can go from the surface to those fuels and then move up the ladder into the tree. So removing uh, overhanging limbs from your home or removing ladder fuels. So this is uh, ideally, you know, in that 30 feet, we won't have any fire, but we might have surface fire and we definitely don't want crown fire. So we wanna move things, separate them apart. Okay, so to kind of illustrate this, um, you can see here on the right, there's a ponderosa, but it's been uh, limbed up to about six feet. So if we had fire in that grass below, it's not gonna be able to catch those limbs. So that's the vertical separation. These trees are also uh, somewhat horizontally separated. I think ideally you want like 10 feet between the, the edges of the trees, so the crowns. Um, and then the tree on the left is a pinion where the limbs go all the way to the ground. 
Um, and so you can imagine here that you can kind of see there's some pine needles under there. If we had that surface fire, it'd be really easy to move that up through that tree. And then right in the middle is a, a lilac, I think. Um, so it's less likely to ignite, but we still want to maybe limb it up just a little bit and then rake out all that uh, dead pine needles and things that are under there. Um, so, uh, you know, right around your home in that 30 feet, think about limbing stuff up, you know, pretty good. I think six feet or eight feet is the rule of thumb, but, um, you know, you don't necessarily have to do that to every tree. If you had a 10 foot tree, you don't want to limit. So this is a kind of some of those trade-offs we're talking about. So here's another image of this surface fire moving around and these trees are spread out far enough. They're tall enough that you can limb them up high enough that that, that fire is not moving up through there. Um, so here again, we're just talking about the vertical separation, horizontal. So in the bottom picture, this is a, like I wanted to put one in here where someone's trimmed up pinion, um, which is maybe not like the most ecologically forestry or ecological forestry technique, but right next to your home, right? You, your priority is saving your home. So we do some things that we maybe wouldn't do other places and we make these kind of uh, manicured looking landscapes. And then as we move further out from there, we think about doing more ecological forestry um, and doing things a little different, maybe like having clumps or that sort of thing. But right next to our home, our goal is to not have any of that crown fire. So in the top picture, you can kind of imagine fire moving through there would be really hot right next to the home. Whereas on the bottom picture, you know, they have that separation from the deck and from the home. I'm running a little bit behind, but I just got a few more slides here. And there's a lot of slides in this one, so thanks for hanging in. So this uh, house um, survived a fire, right? You can see in the top this trailer, and then on the bottom there's a, the same trailer. So you can see how hot it burned pretty much right next to the home. Um, but they had done enough preparation that it didn't actually, you know, the home didn't catch on fire. And this one actually that even right up next to the house, they have some vegetation, but since it was green, um, it survived. I mean, that's not ideal, but if you're gonna have stuff right next to your house, like we talked about having that green, green things in there is better than having dry pine needles. But you can see here the 30 feet out from the house is all clear except for, you know, pretty large trees. So these are just some other pictures of this house. Um, you can see that first five feet, there's not much in there, especially on this bottom picture. And you can see where the fire kind of creeped up and then hit this dirt on the bottom and then went out. So this five feet, like we said, is real important. It's hard to talk too much about the uh, actual structure of the house, but then you can see that this house is all rock and cement. Um, and then the windows are pretty high, so even flame links on there. And then under the deck is pretty clean. There's a few little things in there, but, um, so yeah, so thinking about that five feet, thinking about what's in the 30 feet and how you're going to space those things out, um, and then thinking about the construction, uh, all those different factors we talked about. And a lot of those, like I said, you can, if you don't, if you're not up to replacing all the windows in your home right now, you know, you can mitigate those with other things, how you work right with the, that first five feet and other vegetation. Okay, so um, there's a lot of assessment tools. This link should say, this is another organization that Gabe and I work with, the Santa Fe Fire Shed, but a lot of the same information is on the, all the FAC and M links. Um, so there's a home hazard assessment that we developed with the Wildfire Network that is kind of like a self-guided thing, goes through a lot of what we talked about today. Um, so there's a lot of these assessment tools. You may have um, a volunteer fire department in your area that'll do an assessment like this. Um, so reaching out and figuring out those kind of things is good. Um, and then this will also help you prioritize, um, you know, what you work on first. Okay, so uh, I think in the interest of time, I'll just go through these really quick, but this was a study from the Paradise Fire. Um, and We'll post this uh, presentation later so you can look at this more in depth, but uh, you can see here that um, what they did was they, in California, they do a lot of inspections and they have a lot of data. So they analyze homes that burned in that fire 
and then they had this data to see what was happening. So would DEX increase the odds? Um, uh, having leaves or needles really increase the odds? That's at five feet. You know, your house is 330% more likely to burn if you had those needles. Um, and then there was some things, you know, resistant siding made your odds go down, multi-pane windows made your odds go down. Um, and then similarly here, you know, that's vegetation within 30 feet increased your odds of your house burning. And having that other structure close by that was unmitigated also made those odds go up. Oh, and then uh, slope too, we didn't talk about. in fire behavior, you know, slope and wind also makes fire more intense. So um, in case you didn't get the message, uh, that first five feet zone is really important. Focusing on those flammable materials, thinking about all the small stuff that gets the campfire going is really important. Doing the raking, the mowing, the cleaning, the gutters. Uh, these are all, you know, simple, easy things. Um, and then making sure your vents are screened is also really important. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. Um, we went through that pretty quick as a promise. Uh, we got like five minutes for the top of the hour. We can make, let the questions go a little bit longer. Um, but like I said, there's a lot of great resources out there. Um, that Firewise planting guide is really interesting. There's all these NFPA fact sheets. Uh, New Mexico State Forestry has a big uh, ready, set, go that covers all these things and evacuations. So great, thanks for listening. Um, Dave, you wanna shoot some questions my way? Yeah, we got some can... questions. <laughs> um, cool, yeah, so we had a couple questions come in um, about you know, gas and propane. The first one was, um, Brad Snyder was wondering, are, are buried propane tanks a, still a danger? And I'm mitigating buried propane resources. Um, yeah, so from what I've heard is propane tanks are actually not as big of a hazard as you might expect because what happens is they have like a release valve that will melt at a certain temperature and then they vent but then those flames go straight up. So as long as your propane tank is far enough away from your home, um, it's not, and they also have to get heated up a lot uh, to, before they vent. But if you bury it, obviously it's, it's really unlikely that it's gonna ever heat to that point. So that would be better than having it out. Um, but if you just have a spot, you can put it uh, far enough away that it's not gonna heat up a lot. Um, that would probably be okay too. Okay. Yeah. Then there was also a question kind of along that same line. Um, you know, some homes have propane outlets for gas grills instead of the tanks. Um, is, are these safe? You know, what can be done to make these outlets safe? Sure. So um, I should caveat all of this so that I'm more of a firefighter than a, an expert on all this, but I think you know those those valves, like the few that we saw, they're always right against the home. So if you are, you know, you, another big part of this is creating like an evacuation checklist. So having on your list, um, turn off propane, disconnect grill, as part of your list, and then you've mitigated all the fine fuels right around that valve. That would be what I would do. So, I mean, they're more risky because you have a an outside source for that gas that could catch fire. But if you have it on your plan to turn that off and disconnect the hose that goes to the grill, if you can, if it's hardwired in, just mitigating those fuels around that as much as you can. Um, so that's just another one of those trade-off kind of things. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, uh, Kate Mitchell had a question. Um, she, you know, many folks have mulch near their house for plant moisture. Um, is that an issue? Yeah, so that actually is an issue, right? That mulch, especially in the Southwest, it's nearly impossible to keep it moist. Um, and so this is one that is a little more clear of if you have mulch in that first five feet, you're kind of creating a perfect fuel bed for embers to land in. Um, which is unfortunate because uh, 
and actually we talk about mulch a lot, so this is not a strange question at all, but, uh, but yeah, so if you, if you can not mulch things within that first five feet and have mulch things further out, that would be better um, because that mulch is that perfect kind of fine fuel for things to land in. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a hard one because we want to keep that nice landscaping that we talked about. Uh, but yeah. Mm -hmm. um, great. Uh, someone was, uh, I think it's Pat Burns is wondering, you know, are embers landing in a juniper tree if there's not dead material underneath it going to be okay? I guess it's kind of hard to say. Depends on the time of year, probably, but. Um, so yeah, um, trying to think if I've ever seen that. It seems, <clears throat> so this is like, there's no promises, but generally what happens, it, it's hard for embers to ignite live things. Cause even a juniper in the middle of summer in a dry year is gonna have like 60% water content. Whereas, you know, in the spring, it might be like 300%, but um, embers landing on a tree like that are unlikely to light 